All right, thanks very much, everyone. Um, welcome back. Um, Danny, thank you for the introduction and the invitation and congratulations. I think it's been a, a really successful workshop, really good turnout. Um, so, yeah, so as Danny said, um, you know, I, I was invited really because I think everyone else was busy. Um, but I've done a lot of work over the last few years um, up in Scotland at the University of Stirling and Scottish Institute of Sport, um, working using TMG in an applied setting um, and, and really putting it through its paces uh, from, from the point of view of a practical application. I guess the story that I'm going to tell today is really about the journey we've been on in establishing TMG as part of the support network for the athletes that we work with. Now, Sport Scotland, Scottish Institute of Sport, we have this ethos, this, if you like, this mission statement to use cutting edge technology and innovation in order to support athletes meet the specific needs of different athletes in different sports. Now, the Institute of Sport, as a branch of Sport Scotland, supports a wide variety of athletes across a whole range of sports. This is just a small example, but you can see a wide array of sports, and you can imagine different needs, the different requirements of athletes in these different sports. Swimming, very, very different from judo, very, very different demands from hockey, for example. Gordon Reed, wheelchair tennis player, very different demands placed on his body compared to Ben Kilner, who's a freestyle snowboarder. Now, since 1998, when the Institute was set up, the support has led to creating, or to helping to create, I should say, 18 Scottish World Champions. There have been 36 Olympic and Paralympic gold medalists, 12 European gold medalists, and 69 Commonwealth Games medalists. So we do have a successful breed of athletes up in Scotland, and the Institute's support is key to that ongoing success. Now, what can TMG bring to all these different athletes here in order to answer their specific needs? Again, we've already seen this study. Max summarised this study very nicely. This was from, uh, I want to say, Bostian Simonich's lab. I'm checking with Max, and he's nodding. So, yeah, Bostian Simonich, oh, it says it there. Bostian Simonich's lab. I did make the slides, I promise. And we can see that muscle fibre type composition can be measured very accurately using our TMG in a non-invasive way without the need for biopsies. What does that give us from an athlete's point of view or a coach's point of view? Well, we can make informed recovery decisions. If we know that an athlete is predominantly type 1, slow twitch, fibre based, we know that they are going to be very suited to endurance based activities and their recovery is going to be very, very different from someone who is built for power and built for speed and very type 2 dominant can also help to inform training decisions. And this might even come in at the athlete talent identification stage, where we can try to point athletes in the right direction for what's going to be most suitable for them going forward in order to have a successful career. Now, we can also determine what, what we can call muscle contractile profile. And again, Sergey demonstrated this very nicely in his, uh, in his presentation earlier, and I've just shown a brief summary here. We might see that some muscles are a little bit on the slow side and need a little bit more focus on activation type exercises. We might see that some are a little bit too tight, need some stretch activity to try and loosen those muscles off, to try and bring the body into better balance. And this allows what I've referred to as targeted interventions. Really, the whole point is trying to get away from this one-size-fits-all approach. Okay? One size certainly does not fit all. Every athlete is different. And whether we talk about science and research or whether we're talking about elite sport, every single athlete is an individual and will respond in a very different way because their bodies are very, very different and their requirements might be extremely dis disparate to someone who's competing at exactly the same level in exactly the same sport. Now, another thing we can look at is our levels of symmetry. Again, we've heard about our symmetry already today. Potential injury risk involved in being imbalanced, one side being stronger than the other, one side being faster than the other, more powerful than the other. Also allows for movement balance. In a sport like swimming, where you're using your entire body to propel yourself, having a nice balanced symmetry from left to right side is going to make that job a lot easier to move you through the water. We also get our functional symmetry. And again, this comes down to injury risk. It also comes down to the efficiency of movement. Sergey spoke about antagonist-agonist relationships. 
and about synergist groups and the ratio of muscles within that group and how they all respond and how they work together. Getting down to target individual muscles can help to really optimise any athlete's performance. Now, we've spoken about injury risk of asymmetry, and of course, injuries happen, rehabilitation. We can use TMG to track that, to assess rehabilitation strategies. We can do a little bit of trial and error. Using tensiomyography, it's non-invasive, takes no time at all. Best of all, athlete doesn't have to do anything. They just lie on a bed. And you'll see from Sergey's demonstration, there's no effort required whatsoever from the person who's having the TMG measurement done on them, performed on them. So we can be a little bit more test-retest with tensiomography than we would be with functional tests that require effort, that require motivation, that actually might end up fatiguing the individual more just by performing the test. We can also use it as an objective marker for return to play. Is this athlete ready to return to the field? Athlete says yes. Physio says maybe. TMG doesn't lie. Okay, the TMG is completely non-biased and completely objective. Finally, we can measure fatigue. Some of our work that we've done up in Stirling ourselves showed this decreased displacement following a period of fatigue, following electrical stimulation to induce the fatigue, and it correlated very nicely with changes in MVC, with changes in passive muscle tension. So we know that we can track fatigue in a very, very controlled manner using tensiomyography. This can be used to assess the status of athletes and can track recovery following specific events and specific competitions. Now, a coach wants all of that information. They want it here now. They want it yesterday, to be honest. But before we do any of that, the first step has to be to get an athlete profile. We need to know what that athlete should look like, what we want them to look like, before we can try and answer any of these questions. It's very easy to spot the Scottish swimmer in a swimming pool. Um, now, I'm just going to show you a brief summary of some of the muscles that we look at within swimming. As Sergey said, any peripheral or, or uh, superficial muscle we can measure. So we measure just about everything that we can. We then decide which are the most important muscles, which are the ones we're likely to track across time that are going to give us the best, the clearest overview. And these are some of the ones that we look at in swimming. We look at the medial gastrocnemius, uh, vastus lateralis, bicep femoris. We look at latissimus dorsi as well. Okay? Some upper body measures are important in swimming. Now, after we've performed our profile, we get a look at each muscle. We get a look at the symmetry of those muscles. And we can put that together to form a nice little picture of what our athlete looks like from a muscle contractile standpoint. Now, as I said, one size doesn't fit all. Different strokes for different folks and different sports have different requirements. So any new sport that tensiomography is being implemented in, we need to identify what are the key muscles? What are going to be the most important muscles to look at? Because we're always against time. There's always a time constraint. And the measures can be done very quickly. You know, one, measure, one minute to get one muscle is probably about standard. But sometimes all you have is one minute. So which one muscle are you going to look at? What are the key questions that you're trying to answer? Does it relate to recovery? Does it relate to fatigue? Does it relate to training adaptation? And again, this informs that key muscle decision. But regardless of what muscles, regardless of what questions you're looking at, the first step remains the same. You need to get this profile of your athletes so that you know what they look like, what you expect them to look like.